I was watching the last two Timberwolves games, the one against the Thunder and the one against the Hornets, really a tale of two different type of styles, right? Because against OKC, they were great defensively. They were elite defensively, and they had a lead going into the fourth quarter, and offense and turnovers were the reason why they lost. I mean, they had seven turnovers in the fourth quarter, 21 total. Anthony Edwards missed three straight field, um, three straight free throws. They just wasn't clutch. And then in the Hornets game, they were awful defensively. The Hornets, let me see, let me see these stats. They shot 59% from the field, 38% from three. The Wolves took care of the ball much better here. But I just kept going back to a common theme. And it's I don't trust the Timberwolves in the fourth quarter. In the fourth quarter, it even if they're up by 10 points. It always feels like, okay, are they about to blow this? And this is not just a this year problem. This dates back to two years ago in the playoffs when I think they should have beat the Grizzlies and they blew a ton of fourth quarter leads. So for me, at this point, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's maybe the personalities they have in the locker room. They probably need like more of an enforcer. I don't know if it's Chris Finch. I do think Cat had one of the quietest 60 points I ever seen in, in the Hornets game. He had 60 and it really didn't feel like it. And Chris Finch had to bench him in the fourth because he was such a defensive liability. And the Timberwolves came back and then they gave the ball to Cat the final possession. And um, he's drawing a double. He wants to be the hero and he should have just kicked it out. And then he gets fouled and he's complaining about it. I think it was a foul, but still, I just, I don't know with the Timberwolves. I want to really believe in this team because I believe in Anthony Edwards, but it feels like these fourth quarter struggles can really come back to bite them in the playoffs. You know, can I start this one? What yeah, this go ahead. Timberwolves team reminds me off a lot of is the Utah Jazz in 2021, a team that in the regular season built such a strong defensive foundation. They're going to win 50 regular season games. But they're also a disjointed type of contender where you can't put full stock in their late game offense. This is a team that, as you highlighted, they are not very trustworthy in the words of Chris Finch. They need to grow up because you look at their offense. They don't play very fast. This year, they're 22nd in pace. It's a bigger team that's playing Kyle Anderson at the three and Rudy Gobert at the five. So they have to be so methodical offensively and such rapid, quick, smart decision makers. And these guys are really young. Like we were talking about Hame Hawkins before he's older than Anthony Edwards and Anthony Edwards is expected to lead this team on a playoff run at 22 years old. And this year they're averaging the third most turnovers a game. That's been an issue for them. They're also taking the least amount of field goals too. And they're 24th in three point attempts. They're an efficient team, but they don't play quick enough to me to mask those inconsistent blunders, those moments where their offense stalls out. And a large part of it to me is that Anthony Edwards is still very young in year four, and we haven't seen him take that massive leap like a Shea Gildas Alexander has last year. And until he does, they're not going to have the secondary critter to consistently make up for it. Cat's going to drop 60 here and there. But in the playoffs, we've seen this guy be taken out of games. And it feels like they need one more critter to add on top of Cat for Cat to be that number two, someone you can trust. And uh, you, you highlighted before too, Jack, maybe a terror reserve for this team off the bench will be very useful because you look at that entire second unit, all of those guys are really talented. You look at Nikhil, Kyle, Nas, Shake Milton's been very disappointing for them, replacing Jalen Noel. They're looking for some creator in that unit and not just a really good three and T archetype or in Anderson's case, a, a good basketball player, I should say. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's because... Okay, to me, uh, the late game offensive struggles really just transcend into what, like, what does this team look like when they get into a matchup where their opponent can effectively score against them? Not light them up. Like, uh, you know, the defense is going to do its job, but there will be, especially if you're looking to make a deep playoff run, you'll find an opponent that can effectively score against a really good defense. So when you get into that situation, it is the lack of supplementary creator. It is like you're just looking to Anthony Edwards when he is one of the best 22-year-olds in history. You can probably win basketball games when you get into a situation where Carl Anthony Towns 
is removed is like he's already streaky in the regular season. I'm pretty nervous for what he looks like in this postseason. Um, yeah, it's it's difficult. Like at, at that point, you don't feel comfortable in their ability to generate just reliable offense for the entire team. And what's really frustrating is like I feel like if you're just looking across the roster at like the caliber of offensive player you have Nas Reed off the bench and he is that caliber of offensive yeah. guy but the way that it's structured is he can't he has to come off the bench you can't slot one of those guys at small forward yeah. and you can't like bench Carl Anthony Towns for him and so it's just difficult um I'm not sure what they really do to address this at the deadline. I think they probably ride it out and see what happens in the postseason and like how their season ends. Um, but right now, yeah, the offense, like I mentioned when I was talking about Terry Rogier, it feels unlayered. It feels like you have Anthony Edwards, and if you can get Carl Anthony Towns to play well, that rocks. Beyond that, just not a ton of shot creation. Um, especially like on ball, even attacking closeouts. I would have liked to see uh, Aiden McDaniel take a step forward in that department this season. Mm -hmm. Um, for a 23 year old who's as good at defense as he is, like 11 points per game on 38% from three is fine, but for this specific team situation, uh, it would rock if they could get more of that out of him 100%. Yeah, I think he needs to do more too. They they had an 18 point lead at one point against the Hornets and then they blew it because the Hornets were just scoring effectively against them. And then on the other end, this is really my gripe with the Timberwolves offense is that it's a lot of one on one. It it doesn't feel like there's a true system in place where it's like, okay, let's get an easy shot. Like let's get it, let's have Anthony Edwards come off an off ball screen and let's get him open for an open shot or whoever. It just feels like a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. And when Cat was benched late in that fourth quarter, I thought Anthony Edwards was starting to take over the game a little bit. He had a basket, and it was a really tough basket. It was a really tough layup. But then Cat got back into the game. And because he had dropped 60, a career high, he had 62 on the game, they forced it to him. In that situation, I'm like, listen, I want Anthony Edwards with the ball. The last possession, I'm going to live with it. But because Cat had 62, I mean, okay, it makes sense why he gets the ball late. You know that the defense is going to collapse. But that's on Cat to understand that, okay, I know I have 62. The defense is going to collapse. Somebody is going to be open when mm -hmm. I dribble this ball. Instead of trying to go up on three people, it's probably better if I just pass it out. And, and that's the thing with Cat is, like, he had 62, but because he was scoring so effectively, he forgot about everything else. There was a possession where... I think Miles Bridges blew past Kyle Anderson and there was no help defense. And that was Kat's assignment. And Kyle Anderson looked at him and was pissed killing. off and was like, yo, listen, like you got to be there. And he was clapping his hands. And I, I just feel like Kat is fine being just a scorer. I don't know if Kat is, is he really wants to take his game to the next level and really win at a high level. I feel like he's fine if he just has individual success the trade targets I see for this team, I feel like I always mention TJ McConnell for whoever I'm talking about. <laughs> but TJ McConnell <laughs> really is forward. one of those guys that you really saw the absence of Mike Conley felt last night against right. Charlotte. And if they can use, if they can have just one more point guard that can stabilize the offense when everybody, when they don't have a guard out there, because if it's not Mike Conley, it's Shake Milton. And they kind of do this weird thing where they put Anthony Edwards at point guard and Kyle Anderson comes in or Troy Brown. Like you need to have somebody else that's not Jordan McLaughlin or Shake Milton is what I'm trying to say. Their best lineup statistically, like um, in ter terms of like point differential, is Edwards, McDaniel, Nas Reed, Kyle Anderson, and Rudy Gobert, I believe. That's their best lineup. So uh, when Nas Reed is in a lineup, like you said, like it, it's very effective, but he's just not going to start over Cat. Maybe that's why we were saying early in the year they should trade him, and Timberwolf fans do not want to hear it. But at the end of the day, their offense just is not good enough right now. And when you're paying Cat over $50 million, it does have to be. He made a great point where it's like Cat holds them back in many of the key ways number two cannot. Like this stuff we talk about Jalen Brown off the ball defensively or as a playmaker. And it makes his fit with Jason Tam redundant in the conference finals. 
But with this team being so young, their goal is winning that first round series. And I think one guy that could help them, this player has not been healthy this year, but you mentioned TJ McConnell. I think it'd be a Monte Morris because their guard in Mike Connolly is that pass first team oriented player who will defer to others and is not going to try to get his first, get his own, opposed to Ant, who's looking to score primarily. Amante Morris really opened up the floor where he can play off the ball, can run, pick, and roll with the Nas, and then he can also push the tempo too. That's a big thing for me, gain this team playing more in space. And until they do that, it's going to be an offense that has to be almost perfect in the half court, or at least really damn good. Um, and a lot of that comes down to the roster construction. This is a puzzle that has to be formed perfectly because each player is so specific. Like slow-mo is a prime example. He's one of their six best players. He has to be in the right lineup with spacing and organized defenders. Otherwise it's going to look cluttery in ways it did at times last year in critical moments when this Timberwolves team would play up to competition and then have a sub 500 record versus the five worst teams in basketball. And that leads to them being eighth seed opposed to the fourth or fifth. I wanted to figure yeah. out if the eye test matched the stats in the fourth quarter. And in the fourth quarter, the Timberwolves are 26 in fourth quarter points. They have the fourth most turnovers. They are middle of the pack in terms of plus minus at 0.3. 27th in offensive rating, second in defensive rating. So the defense is still elite in the fourth quarter. And they're 13th in net rating. The offense is bottom barrel in, in the fourth. It, it's It's terrible to watch in the fourth quarter. Yeah, it's a, uh, I don't know, like that. And I, it all leads back to that one dimensionality where it's like, if you're a defense and Cat is going to beat you, fucking fine. Like at the end of the day, that's something that a lot, a lot of the time, especially in a postseason matchup, you're going to be fine with. Like if Carl Anthony Towns beats me, it is what it is. And if you can just force the ball out of Anthony Edwards' hand, especially get stop him from like going to the rim and collapsing your defense, which, that's a very hard thing to do. I know I'm saying it casually here. Uh, he's really good at it. But if you accomplish that, everything that Minnesota is able to do offensively really falls apart. Since 2000, mm -hmm. I dipped into my stats back for this episode. Uh, since 2000, <laughs> in, like, Western Conference Finals appearances, 18 teams have had an offensive rating below fifth. Eight teams have had an offensive rating below tenth. Five have had an offensive rating 15th or lower and one has had a team with a worse offensive rating than Minnesota this season. Uh, they're 19th this year. The 23 Lakers last season were the 20th ranked offense. And so pretty much everyone else, uh, it's like 08 Spurs, 13 Grizzlies, 22 Warriors, 22 Mavericks, and then last year's Lakers. It's elite defenses across the board with a little mm -hmm. bit more reliable star power or spread out offensive approach. And... Like, if Anthony Edwards can hit that level, yeah, sure, it's it's feasible for them to make a deep playoff run, but they definitely don't have, like, supplemental guys who can make up for shortcoming in either one of the top two offensive players. And, yeah, that worries me. I think they will have a fair amount of stuff to address after the postseason. Does that fall on Jaden McDaniels, the lack of su supplementary shot creation? Because for a while, like I've been a huge J Mac fan. I think he's a good athlete and he's got some moments offensively, like a highlight or two, or like this guy can create like a Mikel Bridges. But per 36, he's only averaging 13 points per game. And he's never actually taken a step further beyond that good three and D role while with elite defense. And because of how much money's tied to this core four, they don't have a point guard on roster next year. Financially, you can't really upgrade off the starting lineup. I feel like the the number one limitation that makes them one-dimensional is just that we have high expectations for Ant, but we've also got expectations for J-Mac to be number two. And he's probably not going to be an offensive number two. At least, I don't think so, what we're seeing in terms of the growth. I think it's a weird situation because I think McDaniels is at his best when Cat is not playing. Mm. When Cat doesn't play, I think he takes it upon himself to – be more of an initiator offensively and create for himself. But when Cat is out there, you see him really kind of get ice out the offense and be an afterthought. But then that's a huge gamble to take. You know, you're going to trade a guy who is averaging 20 plus in hopes that someone in theory improves their averages. Right. And for McDaniels, I don't know if jumping to 15 a game is enough. Like he needs to be like an 18 point per game score. Yeah. And like the 18 to 21 range, 
maybe it's better though, you know, but I, it's just so hard to trade cat. His contract is terrible. Nobody wants him. And <laughs> it's, it really sucks. You know, oh he's a God. great player, but really nobody is going to trade for that contract unless you're attaching a couple picks to it. Yeah, he is a straight up negative asset. It's crazy to say that because especially I mean, like we've kind of shit on him with the whole 60 point thing being so fresh in our minds for the vast majority of the season. He surprised me with a his uh like defensive ability at the four slot next to go bear and mm-hmm. B his willingness to seed the number one option completely to Anthony Edwards. And so yeah. I don't like I'm I'm not super heavy like oh my god they they went away from and even though he was cooking for that 60 point game that's a situation that's very unique and i don't foresee them being in super often in the playoffs for most right. of the season the hierarchy offensively and who needs to be taking the most shots and initiating the offense has been extremely clear and it's benefited the wolves i think uh the the point you touched on when cat is off the floor mcdaniels benefits a lot i do think it's also interesting to see that uh when 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 he's off the floor, Anthony Edwards' first pass is a lot of times going straight to McDaniel's mm-hmm. instead of it being like a supplementary third or even fourth pass. Where when right. you get that first pass off the attack, the defense is about as out of sorts as they're going to be, and it's a lot easier for you to maximize what you can do off of Ant's scoring gravity that way. He doesn't get to take advantage of that as much when it's Carl Anthony Towns mm-hmm. who. He's a fine playmaker, and he makes the, the extra pass willingly. But a lot of times, he will catch it, survey the floor, as and like look to create his own shot and score, which he's really good at. But that doesn't necessarily help out the progression of Jaden McDaniel's as an offensive player. 